coming in. Great. Well, welcome. <laughs> this is our forum on equitable enrollment strategies. We know that um, programs are going to be starting to keep about enrollment in the new year. So we thought this seemed like a really good time to start talking about this topic. I'm Christy Merrick. I direct Natural Start. I'm here with Emily Van Land. She's our conference and communications coordinator. She organizes all of the um, forums and she'll be part of the discussion today too. Hey Emily. Um, and we're also um, joined today by Sarah Heller. Welcome Sarah. Sarah is um, the co-founder and former director of Fiddleheads Forest School in Seattle, Washington. And when we were thinking about this topic, um, she came to mind right away because she's somebody that we know has really been thinking about this a lot for quite a while. Um, we've talked with her about it in the past. So we reached out to her to see if she would be willing to share um, some of the things that she's been thinking about um, and some of the enrollment. So this was just the specific enrollment strategies that she's been thinking about for Fiddlehead. So thank you so much, Sarah, for um, being willing to join. I also just wanted to say that I um, was thinking about this topic. We were thinking about who to um, invite to think about this. And I was thinking about Rose Bruce Farrow, who was um, one of our conference speakers this summer. Um, she um, works with Backyard Base Camp in Baltimore. And she told a really great story about how they developed their program, but she also touched on some of their enrollment strategies that they use. Um, so I pulled a clip from her talk that um, I can share if there's time while we're talking today, because I think it really, like I said, is really relevant. Um, if we don't have time today, that's fine. We'll share it out after. Um, and it's something you could always access on the conference platform too, but um, just wanted to call out that she's got some really great thoughts on this too, as do many of you, um, <laughs> which uh, is my next point, um, which is that this is a huge topic and um, there's so many ways to think about equity in enrollment, so many different considerations depending on the specifics of your program, your community. So you are really important to this um, conversation. That's something that we really tried to put out there when we um, opened the registration for this. But this is a, a conversation that we think it's really important for everybody to be a part of. There's no one right answer to this. Um, we're all just here to be in conversation and move this work forward. Um, when you register, we asked um, what kinds of questions you have about equity and enrollment, and you had so many. Um, there were questions in a lot of different areas. It's clear that our community is thinking about equity in a really holistic way, which is really, really wonderful. Um, you had questions about enrollment, like <laughs> big questions like where do I begin or even specific things like enrollment forms and how does that affect um, our considerations around equity. Um, but you also had questions about things like outreach, like who, who's trying to enroll in our programs? Um, how do we attract a diverse range of families to our programs? And really important questions about affordability, like can everyone afford to attend a nature-based program? And what kinds of things can we do as people who are operating programs to make them more affordable while we're still balancing the budget and offering living wages for everyone? So really, really great questions around all of these different pieces um, and questions that aren't even represented here, you know, about how we operate programs, how we make gear affordable, um, all really, really important questions. We only have an hour together. Sorry, I didn't advance. Let's see if this works. We only have an hour together. <laughs> um, so we decided that we would try to really zero in on this enrollment piece. And like I said, it's timely for a lot of programs right now. So. Um, that's going to be the bulk of our focus. Um, but please know that all the questions that you asked are really helpful and we listen and are really thinking about them all because um, they inform us at Natural Start about what things we could be doing um, for our part to help kind of um, provide resources. What could we have more forums on, on some of these other topics? Just really helpful to know what everybody's thinking about, how we can connect you with people who can help you do more. So it's all really helpful. And um, Emily has been pulling a couple of resources um, that are available through Natural Start and through our partners um, that she thought might be helpful that she knew of off the top of her head when she was looking at some of your questions. 
Um, so thank you again, Sarah, for being willing to share. We so, so appreciate it. Thank you all for being here to be part of this conversation too. Um, really looking forward to it. So I'll hand it over to you, Sarah. All right, I'm gonna try and share my screen. Give me a minute to get this set up, presenter view. Okay, Christy, can you indicate that you can see my slide? Uh, hold on, I lost Zoom. On my yes, yes, I see it. It looks good. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> this is a new setup, so. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I am also very excited to just have the opportunity to talk about enrollment, um, something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, and it's kind of exciting to have a platform to get to share some of these ideas because not there's not very many people who want to talk about enrollment. <laughs> um, it's a very specific topic. Um, so um, as Christy said, this is this is sort of this is the story of my experience of deep diving into the enrollment system at Fiddleheads. And I think as, as Christy mentioned, there's a lot of different factors that go into enrollment where your school is located, like the things, the goals that you have in mind, the like whether you're under enrolled or oversubscribed, um, everybody's situation is different. So I just, I really wanna preface this with this is my experience at Fiddleheads. And I think my hope is that this is kind of a idea that's outside of the box um, and might be inspirational and help just get your wheels spinning and help you think about um, how you enroll families. I think um, before a few years ago, I never really like thought about enrollment. I sort of just thought of it as a mechanism for filling open spots. I hadn't really thought about what are we trying to accomplish? What are the goals um, in enrollment? Um, so I, um, our, the Fiddleheads Forest School, enrollment process has sort of always been a lottery. Um, we always just accepted applications and then used a random number generator to pull applications and have them um, fill the open spots. Um, and that worked really well for a long time for us. And we got a lot of really positive feedback um, from parents that they really appreciated that it was simple and transparent. Um, and they appreciated that they weren't being sort of evaluated um, against other families for getting a spot in our program. Um, but the sort of inspiration for making a change came from um, this question that we always included in our application. It was kind of just an open-ended question, sort of tell us more about yourselves. Um, and that was kind of a fun way to get to know like the types of families and who is interested in fiddleheads and why. It was never used in the selection process, but it was just kind of a data point for us in understanding who's applying to fiddleheads. And I started to see some changes in what was being written in that open-ended box from families on their application. I was noticing more families writing about how their child's pediatrician Pediatrician was recommending outdoor school as a good fit for their child, or their child's occupational therapist was saying um, an outdoor school might be really help some of the developmental delays that your child is experiencing, or um, a child who, a family who was saying that their child was really struggling in an indoor program or had been kicked out of an indoor program, or that their child's teacher in an indoor program was really su suggesting that they might have a, um, a better experience at an outdoor program. Um, or a family, we had families that had recently moved to Seattle, say like we had families who recently moved to Seattle from Mexico and had heard about Fiddleheads and really wanted this opportunity for their child. And so these stories were starting to come out in the in the application process, but what I was noticing is that our random lottery process was not capturing these families, was not giving these families who would really benefit from the opportunity of being an outdoor program, it wasn't giving them the opportunity to come to Fiddleheads. So I started to wonder how we might change our enrollment process. Um, I started to ask a lot of questions. I still have a lot of questions, um, but I started to wonder sort of what are we trying to accomplish in our enrollment process? Again, I had just thought of enrollment as a way of like filling spots and I didn't, the nice thing about the lottery was that it felt like it took away any bias in the process. It was a simple system to execute. It didn't take a lot of administrative time um, and it felt fair, but I realized what it didn't feel is it didn't feel equitable. Um, and so I started to wonder like, um, what is the, so what are we trying to accomplish in this process? Are we trying to find families that are a good fit for Fiddleheads? Are we um, wanting to prioritize um, certain types of families or certain types of experiences? Are we avoiding things? Are we trying to find, trying to avoid enrolling families who might have children with behavioral challenges? Or are we trying to avoid families who don't have a lot of experience spending time outdoors? I started to ponder all of these questions. Um, and then I started talking to people. I started, um, 
talking to other school directors and administrators. Um, I consulted with the parent group at Fiddleheads to see what their thoughts were. Um, and there were a lot of people who were interested in engaging in the conversation, but didn't necessarily have um, new, new ideas um, about how to do this. A lot of people have um, been doing enrollment and there's lots of different ways to do it. So I encountered a lot of different ways to do it. I started also looking on the internet and looking at both preschools and private schools to see um, what their process was and reading through applications and seeing if I could figure out what are, how are these schools making their decisions about which families they're enrolling. And I really didn't come up with much. I really, it seemed like there was a lot of, there was a lack of transparency across the board in what schools were using to choose the families that were gonna be in their programs. Um, there also seemed to be very lengthy applications with a lot of paragraph and essay questions, which also sort of seemed to cloud the process for me. Um, but I did get um, one parent in the Fiddleheads program had worked in education for a long time. And she suggested to me this idea of a weighted lottery. She had worked with schools in New York City that were charter schools and had used a weighted lottery to do enrollment. And I had never heard of a weighted lottery before and started um, doing some research. So I did some research into that. Um, I also wanted to think about things like what are this, what is this conversation not? Um, addressing, right? It's not addressing things like um, other types of barriers to enrollment, right? So I was really thinking about enrollment, but I wasn't thinking about like transportation issues of people getting to our program or the number of hours in a day that our school was um, operating. We weren't thinking about sort of the money of like the, the cost. So this enrollment piece is very specific, was very specific. So, but I felt like there was a lot of things that still weren't getting addressed. I had to consider where my bias shows up in this um, process. Um, and that sort of goes to this last bullet of acknowledging the privilege and the power of being in a position of being the director at a school and being the person who makes these decisions around um, who, what the enrollment process is. Um, and I was able to consult with and talk with a lot of people and bounce my ideas, get reinforcement um, and support for what I was doing, but it's still, I still felt, was really trying to be aware of this position that I was in, um, in making these decisions um, and didn't necessarily have do, I just wanted to acknowledge that, I guess, um, as part of this process. Um, and then I think the other piece to acknowledge too is that having the time and the resources to really deep dive into this enrollment process was also sort of a luxury and a privilege, right? To be able to have the administrative overhead to be able to spend the time on developing something like this. That's not something that every school has. Um, and then overhauling enrollment process was taking a risk, of taking a financial risk um, in, the, in making a change um, in how we were enrolling families at Fiddleheads. So I went to, on to try to try and build this weighted lottery idea. And I sort of, this is a place where I felt like um, I, I think there's still a lot of work to do, but I really wanted to figure out how to elevate families in the lottery who would benefit the most from outdoor school. And that's, that was sort of the, what I put at the top of my thinking was like, how do I, how do I elevate families in this process who are going to benefit the most? So when I think about children who are neurotypical from very supportive households, right? They may thrive in an indoor program and they might thrive in an outdoor program. So how can I think about who, what families and what kids are really gonna benefit from this um, experience? And that helped me think about um, who the, um, what the weights in this lottery were gonna be. Um, so like I said, for many years, Fiddleheads used a random number generator. So we would have an Excel spreadsheet with all of our applications and we would just, use a random number data, pull that application out and put them in a spot, pull the next application out and put them in a spot. But what I wanted to do was figure out how to create a lottery that elevated different families. Um, one thing to think about um, that I wanna mention is that we did consider um, the legality of some of the decisions we were making and consulted um, with people of Fiddleheads as part of the University of Washington. So consulted with some folks at the university to make sure that we were um, following a path that was legal um, in the process, right? Like in Washington state, we, at least being part of the university, we weren't allowed to use race as a way of, um, as, a, as a selecting factor. So knowing those things when you start to um, look more deeply at enrollment processes and systems and making selections, having some consulting with a lawyer, having some ideas about this, I think is a good um, starting point as, um, as part of this. Um, let's see. So this is again, a unique situation to Fiddleheads. We were very, very oversubscribed. The pandemic made that even worse. I don't know about worse, but made it the demand even higher for a very few number of spots. So um, this weighted lottery that I'm gonna to refer to was used in enrolling for the 2021-2022 school year. So it took place um, the previous past winter. Um, and I decided to pick some weights. 
the things that were going to elevate these families. And so the things that I chose were financial need. Um, and Fiddleheads had already kind of been doing a little bit of a weighted lottery. Um, we found that when we had only sort of 10 or 15 open spots, if we filled it really randomly um, from using the lottery method, that we might end up with 10 or 15 families who didn't need any financial aid. And then we had this financial, this financial aid bucket of money that wasn't going to anybody. So we had already started um, doing a financial aid lottery ahead of the general lottery. So making sure that we were giving out all the financial aid we had available to families who qualified before filling the rest of the spot. So I kept that weight that we, Fiddleheads had been doing that probably since like 2016, 2017. The other weights that I added were a referral um, from a physical therapist, occupational therapist, or pediatrician. Um, and I think in the future, I would add teachers. We were finding that there were a lot of students who had been participating an in indoor program and we're being um, told by those teachers that their child would probably um, have a more positive experience in an outdoor program. And then the third weight that I added was neighborhood. Um, and that was to sort of get at this problem of noticing that um, the majority of the families participating in Fiddleheads were coming from next door, the neighborhoods that bordered the location of Fiddleheads. Um, and that makes sense, um, but also the the, the Neighborhoods that border fiddleheads tend to be very white, upper middle class uh, families. And we were seeing families from other parts of the city really wanting to be a part of fiddleheads, but not having the opportunity because of the just high percentage. When you have 250 applications, if 200 of them come from nearby neighborhoods, the families from other neighborhoods just aren't going to get come up in a random process. So that was the third weight that I added. Um, I did want to mention the what we use um, is Google Forms. It's free. Um, it's a really great way. We used Google Forms to build our application. Um, it has some uh, formatting limitations, but in the end, it was really the ideal solution for us. Um, and part of that is because you can take responses in a Google form and put them into a Google sheet, which acts like Excel. Um, and that was a really clean and clear way to organize the lottery. Um, I think one of the things I love about enrollment is that it feels like a puzzle. Um, and the Google Sheets was a great way to sort of organize the puzzle. Um, so I'm just gonna make sure we're good here. Okay, so that was sort of the system I put in place. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about these weights, um, because I think this idea of a weighted lottery can get used in a lot of different ways. And I think the thing that you can sort of toggle are the weights. Um, and this was just sort of my first go at doing a weighted lottery. I think I have a lot of reflection and a lot of questions. It's unclear what the effectiveness of these weights were, but this was the place that I felt most comfortable starting. Um, and as I said, financial need had been one that we had already been using for a while. I did take the opportunity in redesigning our enrollment to redesign our financial aid application. Our original financial aid application was um, sort of pretty involved and required families to submit tax information um, and other sort of proof or evidence of their income, um, which felt like a barrier. Um, and I talked to the director at the time of the Olympic Nature Experience, which is an outdoor school here in Washington State. Um, and they have a very, um, they have their, their financial aid application is on their website. It's very transparent. It's very clear how it works. And I really liked it and talked to the director about borrowing um, some of their language and their process um, and really felt like it um, enhanced the transparency of our process. We got rid of um, and needing any proof, because I do think that's a really big barrier to families who might be hesitant about applying for need is by having to like come up with those talks that tax documents or come up with other forms of evidence. Um, so we sort of used language that really asked families to sort of use the honor system in reporting what their need was um, and telling their story. And it was a little bit more focused on like telling their story. Um, and that helped. So financial need was a big one. Um, I did want to mention that Fiddle has, hasn't always had um, a financial aid uh, like a scholarship fund. Um, we started it a number of years after the school had opened um, and it has evolved and ebbed and flowed, um, but it's been a kind of consistent thing and we do focus a lot of our fundraising efforts on um, this financial aid pool that we have, or this fund that we have. And we do sort of a holiday ask every year. We ran a spring event um, called a walkathon, sort of pre-COVID times. We would make shirts and t-shirts and sell them. Um, but we really, this is the place where we just kind of really focused our fundraising efforts because it felt like it could make the most difference um, in creating access and accessibility um, to families. And then the second weight um, that I mentioned was this referral from a pediatrician, occupational therapist or pediatrician. Um, and this is the one that um, I think brings up the most questions just because P it, anybody can write in a box that like their pediatrician suggested outdoor school. And so it's the one that um, is the most 
gray and maybe the one that's going to be easiest for families to sort of fudge if they're really um, trying to get it, if they if they're, they want to sort of work all angles to get into the school. Um, but I, again, just encourage people to use the honor system. I really didn't want to feel like I was asking people for letters of referral or, again, proof or evidence just because it felt like barriers. But I think this is another one that could be rethought or changed. Um, but I, but in the end, I would say I think this was the most effective in really capturing families who are going to benefit the most um, from the Fiddleheads experience. And then this third one is really specific to Seattle. I'm not sure like how I would um, how it would work for other cities if they would have a resource like this. But uh, the city of Seattle puts out this amazing map. Um, it's the Racial and Social Equity Index, and they take data from information from all over the city, um, combining things on like race and ethnicity, um, health advantages and disadvantages um, to sort of identify where priority populations um, are in the city. And then they, and, and so they create these little pockets where you can see where the highest need is and the lowest need is. So sort of the purple color is the um, highest disadvantaged families. Um, and then blue and green are like the lowest disadvantaged. So you can sort of see the breakdown. And I really like that this index is so comprehensive, right? It's not just looking at race or wealth. It's looking at a lot of different other factors. Um, the yellow star is where Fiddleheads is located. And so we typically draw from those sort of um, lowest disadvantaged um, neighborhoods right around the Arboretum. And But we were getting a lot of interest from elsewhere in the city and really wanted to find ways to capture that. So this, this was not perfect um, by any stretch of the imagination, but it was effective in really um, diversifying where in the city families were coming from. But you could see in, a, in the highest disadvantaged bucket, one of those purple boxes, there may be families who don't fit that demographic living in that neighborhood. They're just, all this is indicating is that there's a high density in that area. So that was the third weight. Um, and now in terms of running the lottery, um, we received over 250 applications. Um, and this is where like talk about administrative time um, that is dedicated, right? This new system, what took a lot more like admin time to operate. And so I went through every application and I needed to determine whether they qualified for financial aid, um, whether they had a referral for outdoor school and, um, and then using their address, I put it into that map to figure out where they lived and then color coded them. Um, and in the end, there were 82 applications um, that qualified for this weighted lottery. Um, and some of those applications came into the lottery multiple times, right? So if a family qualified for a financial aid, they'd get pulled over into the weighted lottery. If they get, they also had a referral, their application would get pulled again. So you might, there were a number of applications who that um, were duplicated or triplicated, which again, gave them more weight in the lottery. So instead of their application showing up once, their application was showing up three times and in this much smaller pool of applicants. Um, so it, and in terms of the weighting, I saw that work. Um, I could see how it shrunk the size of the lottery. It really elevated a certain number of applications. Um, and I designated 20% of the open spots for this weighted lottery. And then I did 80% from the general lottery, but also included the weighted applications. So some of them got pulled out in that process too. Again, another place where there could be adjustment movement. I just sort of started with 20 and 80% because that's what felt good to start with. Um, so that was running the lottery. And then what worked? It was kind of hard to know what worked um, because we never done this before. Also, we were coming from a year where Fiddleheads had gone from having probably close to 80 families involved to only having 24 during that um, sort of peak pandemic year. Um, so we had 24 families that one year and then the we here we were enrolling for the next year, which we were growing back to having close to 60 families. So there wasn't a lot of comparison. Um, but what, what we did see um, are just some just like interesting points around the diversity of languages that were going to be spoken by Fiddleheads families. I'll also mention that these, these sort of data points that I have here are from probably March or April 2021. I'm sure that the families have since had, the schools probably since had some turnover as families' lives change and they've had to re-enroll. So I, this is not necessarily representative of the demographics at Fiddleheads right now. This was in this one point of time. Um, we were able to see the percentage of families that we were offering aid to. Um, and then the biggest one here is this 32% of all families were referred um, by, to outdoor school in one way or 
another um, and reported having minor physical disabilities or developmental delays or being neurodiverse. And that was huge. Um, and the stories that we were getting from families around, like we've been at three different schools and they, my child has really, really struggled. We were so excited to try the outdoor school. Um, we had one family who had a child who had, um, who has myopia and um, their optometrist recommended being in an outdoor school because it's a degenerative eye disease that can't be reversed, but it can be slowed down by being in an outdoor environment and being able to focus and look at a distance versus being in four walls. And so there was just a lot of families with really unique stories who might not otherwise have been able to be a part of a program like this who are really going to benefit from the opportunity to be outdoors. Um, and that, those stories were really boosting for me that, that maybe I was onto something and maybe this weighted lottery could continue to evolve and change in ways of sort of capturing um, these types of families. We could compare some data. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here. I'll make sure Christy has the slides to send to everybody in case you're curious, but of just um, comparing race. So I'm gonna mention, we do collect demographic data um, from families in their application, it's optional. And that demographic data is hidden until after the lottery. So we can't see things like family income or race, um, languages spoken. We can't see any of that information in their application until we reveal it after the lottery. Um, so that was again, just a way to like, just try and sort of make sure that we were operating in a system that felt uh, really equitable to everybody and also felt legal um, in the development of this system. So comparing with a um, graph from the Natural Start Alliance, you could look at the race um, and see, it'll be interesting, it would be interesting, more interesting to see sort of down the line how this changes and evolves. Um, could look at household income as a comparison. I felt like this was one area where um, we didn't make a lot of progress against sort of Seattle's median income. Um, but I think there's other factors when you look outside of enrollment and what the barriers are to the enrollment process, it, right? As you, families who are making under $100,000 a year, are they, do they have two working adults in their household and they need full-time care? Fiddle has doesn't necessarily offer that. Do they have one parent um, who's at home so they don't and they don't have additional income to spend on expensive outdoor preschool, right? There's other factors that come in here. And I think it's interesting to see how the enrollment process may or may not be impacting um, shifts in this area. Um, this is the way that I question the most um, because the map is really interesting. Um, it feels very tangible, but I think it's hard to measure how effective it is um, because the highest disadvantaged zones, there may be like subsidized housing against alongside mega mansions or high income earners alongside low income earners, right? It's like, it's not necessarily easy to control, um, but it seemed like it was effective in that we were able to see the evidence that families were um, able to, we did see families coming from other parts of the city that we had never had families attend fiddleheads from before. So I thought it was interesting. Um, I think I had explored using zip codes, like there's lots of different ways to think about this, but I do think this, this area needs some more exploration. Um, in addition, it wasn't, didn't work for families who applied to fiddleheads who lived outside Seattle city limits. I wasn't able to categorize them in this area. So something to think about. Um, so in this process of doing the lottery and then also just talking to lots of different people about enrollment, I got a lot of ideas about these barriers to enrollment and there's no perfect solution, but I did want to talk about other aspects of enrollment that are sort of seen as barriers to lots of different types of families. So one of them is this enrollment season, um, at least out here in the greater Seattle area, um, outdoor schools, preschools, um, private schools, they have an enrollment season. They do an open house in the fall or the early winter. They run and you, you send in your application, your applications are reviewed. You get notification of whether or not you got a spot sometime in February, you pay your deposit and you start school in September. Um, for a lot of families, that's just, that doesn't work for them. They don't know what they're doing tomorrow, next week, next month. They're not thinking about school. They have other factors happening in their life that are putting, that put a lot of pressure on them that take their current attention. And they might not think about what they want to do for education for their child if they even want to send them to preschool till August. And that then means all of these schools are no longer available to them and their family. Um, so one of the things that I did um, was reserve um, a certain number of spots. I think it was six spots total at Fiddleheads for late enrollment, for late summer, to really try and capture those families who may find out about Fiddleheads much later or really start thinking about education much later. Um, but again, that creates administrative overhead. You don't get the guaranteed deposit in March um, to, for your budget. Um, so there's, there's, it, it, you have to wait, there's different things to weigh and consider, but this was a barrier that had come to my attention. In the application process, things like the fee, 
that could that is a barrier to families when they can't afford to pay a fee to apply. The length of the application, families may not have a lot of time. They may be doing applications on their phones. Having lots and lots of pages and lots of information they have to type through can be a barrier. Is also if your application is only available in English. A very lengthy application can be very draining on a parent who may not have English as their first language. Um, having an application that's only digital, again, might be a barrier. So thinking about offering a paper version or being able to have a family call you on the phone and fill up the application over the phone. Um, as I mentioned, showing proof of things um, can be a barrier. Paying a deposit, one of the things we started doing at Fiddleheads was setting up payment plans for families if they wanted or waiving it for families who are receiving aid. Again, not all schools can do that, right? You have to have the financial or the budget sort of wiggle room to make that possible. Um, we never at Fiddleheads were able to maintain multi-year wait lists because it was just too much work. But also, again, a barrier if you have families who are reaching out to you and getting on their wait list when they're pregnant or their kid is one and, and then they get to be a priority when their kid is three, you're leaving out those families who may not be thinking as early or planning as far in advance. Um, and I know that one of the things that was brought up um, in the questions that Christy mentioned was outreach strategies. And this is something that I think there's a lot of potential for that we just didn't do a good job of at Fiddleheads because we were so scared of more applications. Um, we just relied on word of mouth. But again, then we were really limiting who we were reaching. Um, so I think some of the things that um, the parent group at Fiddleheads had suggested that I thought about were how to create sort of low barrier avenues for families to get to know you, right? Free events, is it like a way to just come and see your space and have a do a craft activity and play a game? Is it um, just having open play time in your space as a chance to get to meet the teachers and the administrators? It's not even open in house, it's just to come enjoy our space um, and let's be together type thing. Or are you taking your school into other communities? Are you showing up at a, at a farmer's market? Are you popping up in a nearby park? Are you showing up at events that that community is um, arranging? Can you find a way to sort of have a table or be a part of that? Like how can you show up in those communities you might be trying to reach. But again, I think this is like, that's a whole nother forum is talking about outreach strategies and how are you connecting with the populations that you're hoping to reach. Um, so those are some of the barriers that I thought of um, and that people sort of brought to my attention around enrollment. But again, so narrow, it's just related to enrollment. Um, and then I think the other piece that comes up is there's a, there are barriers beyond the lottery that I think beyond enrollment that are um, important to consider. And I think I mentioned this at the beginning, but like being the sole director and having to make these decisions really came, brought me to a sort of uncomfortable place of being in the person in power of making these decisions. Um, so I think finding a way to sort of disperse that, um, whether it's creating like an enrollment committee within your school or an enrollment group that you can consult with in your area of other school directors to be able to just continue to sort of talk about and unpack um, enrollment process, I think is important. Again, probably future forums, but thinking about like, how are you breaking down the barriers of gear to outdoor school? How are you, is there ways that you can provide transportation? Uh, one of the things we had talked about um, doing at Fiddleheads at some point was finding ways to partner with other organizations to create pathways for enrollment. So finding ways to partner with um, indigenous groups. Are there ways to get those kids and those communities into your school? Um, are the, can you reach out to local physical therapists and occupational therapists who may be able to refer kids to your program? Are there other local um, inclusion schools and programs that may be able to sort of complement or supplement or you could work together and have kids attend both the inclusion school and your program? Um, lots of families needing full-time care, not often offered in nature-based. So that's another thing to think about. How could you be year round to serve those families? So again, but again, there's lots of barriers to this as a school offering these, if you have budget limitations and things like that, that you're already trying to consider. Um, I think one of the things that came out, this is sort of my last point, um, is that by using a weighted lottery and really shifting the demographics and the types of families that we're going to be accessing fiddleheads, we also really had to consider, um, how are we supporting teachers in being able to welcome like neurodiverse children or children with developmental children with development delays or disabilities that they may not have a lot of experience working on? And so the so the other piece of this is finding ways for teachers to be excited about being a more inclusive program um, and giving getting them the training they need to feel confident in working with a wide range of students and families. Um, and one just plug for a free resource is the Seattle Children's Play Garden, located here in Seattle, has on their website a really cool um, and amazing inclusion toolkit. It's a PDF 
PDF you can download. They also offer virtual trainings right now that you can um, attend to really um, learn about these. And they're an outdoor program working with a wide um, diversity of students. And so they've got a lot of really great suggestions there. I think looking for local trainings on partnering with families, supporting challenging behaviors, trauma-informed practices, that type of stuff can really support teachers in feeling empowered um, and confident in working with these families. Here in um, the Northwest in King County, we have this really great program called the Northwest Center Impact Program. It's funded um, and they actually do, they will partner with schools and teachers to support individual students um, free of cost. So they will send in their experts to sort of observe and support the teacher, strategize virtually with them to work with um, certain students. So again, if you're local, but looking for local resources like that, that might really help boost your school's ability um, to be more inclusive, I think is um, the other piece that has to come with shifting the types of um, families that you're going to be working with in your program. So I have talked a very long time and I want to give other people a chance to share because again, this is my, this was my sort of path and process and system building. I think there's a lot of room for improvement um, and I'm really interested to hear um, what everybody else has to say. Um, I also like talking to people. Um, I am interested in sort of this whole world and talking to people. So if you want to reach out, um, this is my contact info. I think Christy will also include it um, in the follow-up information that um, she provides. So I'm going to stop talking and stop sharing and pass it over to Christy. There were actually some questions for you, Sarah. Sorry, I'm jumping in. I, Christy, I shouldn't have. I, I was just keeping track of them on the side. So I went, I thought I could just pull them out from the chat and read them to you. And um, so let's see, I'll just start from the first one. Um, and sorry if you address any of these, but uh, do families pay anything to be part of the lottery? No, we have never had an application fee at Fiddleheads. Okay. Um, do you give priority to siblings or returning families? Good question. I did not um, mention that. Yes, we do give priority to siblings and alumni families. So that happens prior to the um, lottery. Um, and someone asked if you're uh, the the application for Fiddleheads is on the website because some people would like to be able to see it and see what language you used for um, some things. I'm not sure if it's on there currently. Um, I can certainly, if you reach out to me, I can send an old version. The current director, um, Maddie Cole, you could also reach out to her and see. Um, it will be available, I'm guessing, as they head into enrollment season. Um, but I, and I'm happy to share what I've created in the past there too. So. Great. Um, and someone said, when you mentioned financial aid, how did you determine the amount of scholarship each applicant needs? Um, this is a place where, and I have information, I don't know it off the top of my head, but where I didn't make financial aid decisions. So I would pull applications that um, from families who had applied and give them to a colleague who made that decision. So this was another area, way of sort of removing some bias and sort of spreading some of the process out is that um, my colleague made those decisions and there was, there was a rubric that had been built to make those decisions. Um, and I can share sort of what that process was, um, but there was sort of a like a rubric for doing it. It wasn't just case by case. There was wiggle room, but there was a process um, for doing that. Thanks. Um, another question about tuition. Um, if you if you choose a tiered tuition, and also let me just say, Sarah's not the only one that can answer questions. If anybody else has any input, you're welcome to unmute and answer as well. Because um, I think this one might apply to many programs. Um, if you choose a to use a tiered tuition, um, how do you consider um, an income that might be higher, a higher bracket um, when they have four children versus someone who's in higher income and only has one child? Like, does that play into it at all? We didn't do a tiered tuition. We just had the fiddlehead. So I'm probably not the right person to ask that, <laughs> answer that question. <laughs> And anyone, like I said, you can unmute yourself. You have the ability to do that. You can also answer questions in the chat. We're, we're keeping track of these. We'll um, consider them, like Christy said, as we think about future resources or discussions to have. So um, I saw a question um, too, and Sarah, I don't know that you need to answer this, but because you, you kind of addressed it. Um, someone asked, would you have uh, considered race or ethnicity if your state permitted it because i do believe some states permit this and you said you would just work with a lawyer like that's like kind of the best right to see what's allowed in your state just make sure that you're 
not doing anything that's off limits, I think is a really important place to start. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I think it's a really good question. It's not one that I have thought about. I would be interested to hear if other people had thought about that. Like if you could select based on race, would you? And someone asked, what kind of lawyer did you work with? We just worked with people at the University of Washington. Okay. <laughs> not a specific lawyer. Does anyone else have questions? Um, oh, I see maybe a question in here. Do you share with applicants that the lottery is weighted? If so, do you ever get pushback from applicants who might not have any weight to their application? Uh, yes, I share that it's weighted. I was fairly, trans fairly transparent about, I, again, transparency, I think is just, as a, even for me as a parent looking at other schools, I felt really frustrated not knowing like what, how, like if I'm applying, it sort of feels like a black hole. So I was really transparent about what the weights were and how the weighted lottery was gonna work. Um, I didn't receive pushback. Um, we received a lot of really positive feedback about it, um, but I'm, I'm not sure that um, that's necessarily an indicator of how families felt about it. I'm not sure a family would necessarily feel comfortable voicing their um, res reservations or concerns about a weighted lottery process. I think there's probably a different way of sort of finding out that information, right? Because if you're a family that's applying and you really want your kid in, are you really going to start questioning their processes <laughs> as part of that process? So um, I, I don't, I wouldn't say that the fact that we didn't get pushback was a sign that people weren't happy with it. Great. I don't see any other questions in here, but I don't know if you've been able to keep track of the chat. Probably not. I know it's hard when I'm presenting to keep an eye on both, but there is a lot of comments in here too, just about how helpful this is. So I just want to make sure that you don't miss that, that, that hey, people really enjoyed the information you shared, are really looking to forward to any other resources you can share, and that this was just really helpful and made them think about changes they can make. So don't want you to miss that part. <laughs> Thanks. And I did, I did see in the chat that Maddie has is on here and she included a link to the 2021 application for fiddleheads. So if you want to grab that while you're on the chat, you can. Hi, Sarah, I have a question. Hi. Oh, um, I'm wondering if you, now that you have kind of started tackling the piece of the barrier related to the application and enrollment, have you started down the list of all those other barriers? And do you have any techniques you've been using or strategies or anything that uh, you can share. I think all those barriers are things that my program faces every year, all, every day, and I'd love your insight. Um, I probably should just clarify. I'm not, no, I left Fiddleheads this past June, so I'm sort of um, pursuing uh, my own path right now of um, sort of figuring out what's next and um, doing things like this because I think it's really interesting. So I'm not currently in a position where I'm actively um, working on an enrollment system. Um, it's more for me right now just about having these um, these conversations. I think if I was still at Fiddleheads and in the position of thinking about this, I think my next big step would be to tackle outreach. Um, I think that that was a difficult one to tackle during COVID, um, but I think finding ways to connect with different communities and, and making fiddleheads seem like building relationships with people and communities in ways to just sort of create pathways was, is kind of what felt like the natural next step um, beyond this lottery. I think this might be a, a good transition. Um, Keelan, I see that you're going to talk. And I, actually, um, I think it's a good timing because you're from White Pine programs, right? Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. So, so I just wanted to, to kind of transition into that um, in looking at a lot of the questions that we got and that sort of last question there um, and talking about the barriers. Sarah, I think that slide where you talked, you showed some of the barriers and some ways to address it was like really, really helpful. Um, but one thing is considering like where you're offering your program and like going out into the community um, and I wondered, uh, we just did a member spotlight with White Pine programs, and I wondered if they might wanna share um, how they've addressed some of those barriers. Yeah, definitely. I'm, my name is Keelan Wackman. I'm relatively new to White Pine, but I have a, a long history in trying to build diversity and access for education programs. And I apologize in advance if my internet's a little unstable. I'm actually at a farm right now where we host one of our programs. Um, and I was going to chime in because I saw in the chat someone asking about sort of self-select tiered tuition and fees. And that's something that we have started to explore because we received feedback that our application was arduous and excluding people for some of the reasons that have already been mentioned. Um, so we were just sort of out of curiosity, like, well, what if some of our 
community and adult programs and other, like we just overtly put it out there where we have a sliding scale, pay what you can type of model. And then we have an option to select, like, this is what it costs. And then we have an option to select, if you pay this, it includes a tax deductible portion that is a donation. And we're very clear in like the description of that ticket level or that registration level that um, you're supporting other people's ability to pay less and attend. So it's been a nice way, you know, anecdotally, as we've heard from people, it's been a nice way for them to empower themselves around evaluating some of their own um, privilege and opportunities to lean in and creating access and opportunity for other people. Um, hard to say right now if it's hugely successful or accurate or achieving all of our goals. Um, but we have noticed that it's been really successful in having more diverse attendance at things. So that's sort of one track that is for our more traditional programs that we typically host in collaboration with land trusts and in areas where you still have to have a computer to register and get the email to remind you to do so and the interest in finding out and being part of the network and being able to drive to the location. But I think what you're speaking of is that we've also realized as an organization that if you want to truly eliminate barriers to access and be able to provide exceptionally transformative experiences for students who may not otherwise ever have an opportunity or inclination to be in a nature-based program, those aren't the parents that are going to be seeking out your financial aid application or your sliding scale event registration. So we have intentionally built partnerships with public schools, low-income community center after school programs, senior centers, um, hospitals, um, mental health institutions. So we're proactively going to places and saying, we believe that your population would benefit from our services and then figuring out how to bring our naturalist educators there. So in some of those partnerships, it's a mixture of like, we're donating a lot of our time and service. The Maybe the Parks and Rec Department is paying some nominal fee. Um, there's grant support. We're building collaborative grant relationships. Um, and that definitely we see in those programs on the ground that there are students who are having those moments that make us all want to do this type of work where it's like really lighting them up in a way like, wow, I didn't realize this was my heart song. Um, and my parents never go outside. Like my mom says, the woods is a scary place full of ticks. I had no idea it was full of fun things. Um, and often mixed in, like I teach at the Kittery Community Center, which is a, you know, a mixed population where there's very low income families who work in the shipyard there. And there's also more affluent families who live along the coast. And in some of the community programs that we run, we might have a couple of kids who are parts of families who have accessed our program, maybe received aid in the past or not, mixed in now with a bunch of their peers who were always sort of shyly jealous that these kids were getting pulled out for these enrichment programs that cost an additional fee. Um, so it's been really, I would say, rewarding. It's probably an understatement to recognize that just by showing up where they are and not making it an optional thing that parents have to make any decisions about, all those kids who would be too afraid to ever bring the conversation up are in the woods with us and having their minds blown. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. So I don't know if that answers everybody. Yeah, and I also posted in the chat um, that you can read the full um, member spotlight for White Pine programs. We asked some more questions around this and there's a, there's some more answers there. And then also you can always check out their website where they talk even more about it. So um, I have a question for the group in response sure. to that. Um, so one of these types of programs that we've created 
in an effort to eliminate access barriers is a drop-in preschool program. And we just tried it out and it's been very successful. We've had really good attendance, but we did like a trial period, which is scheduled to expire in December. And it was a partnership between our nonprofit, the land trust that is hosting it on their preserve and the York Parks and Rec Department. And now the question is coming, like, do we continue? And I'm considering based on just what I believe I'm seeing, yet again, bringing all my bias to the trail, whether I should reach out to the families and ask them, would they be able to pay a sliding scale fee to attend or not? And I'm wondering for the group, if any of you have ever been part of a program that was offered for free to the community as sort of a test and made a transition. And if you have any suggestions or insight around doing that communication with grace and thoughtfulness. Fairly quiet group. <laughs> I think it's a great question. I, I uh, this is Amy. I just, it's not 100% related, but I do think it's important um, to really consider your staff in terms of like how you're going to run your program too, because I don't know if this is true across the country, but I know for us, like staffing shortages is, is a real challenge and just making sure that whatever tuition we are charging is going to afford us the ability to pay staff a livable wage. So I think when you do that messaging, if, if you kind of like would bring in something about how this is going to help us be able to, you know, pay our staff that that's running this program, I think families that connect with the staff running it, you know, take that to heart more. If, if that's, I'm assuming that might have something to do with it. Thanks, Amy. Um, we're running low on time. I, I wanted to actually, uh, there's, uh, I think she's here. Someone else who is here. Well, now I'm not seeing her name. Um, anyway, we had, there was uh, Francis Hoover. Oh, oh, there you are. I see your name. Um, so, uh, sorry, lots of names, <laughs> lots of names um, in the, in the forum today. So there was also some questions around, um, marketing and reaching folks that are in your community, um, and outreach. And so I wanted to call out another program. Um, the Smith Memorial Playground, which is in Philadelphia is starting an urban nature preschool. Um, and I, I, I had a, some brief exchanges with Francis and I wondered, Francis, if you wanted to share a little bit about, um, what that was like when you were opening the program, because um, you mentioned uh, a, a goal was to reach families that were right there in the community. Um, so if you want to unmute and, and share a little bit. Sure, I was, um, you know, listening to uh, the information that was just being shared and I felt like there was a lot of, um, con I connected a lot with um, what, um, is it Keelan? what she was saying about um, the things that she did. And she talked about um, having to, to go out into the community and, and, and make connections. And I think what um, worked well for us is that A, we had pre-established trust and relationship with families um, and going out into the community was important to that. And not only with families and where we didn't have connections with families, we had connections with institutions that were important in the community. So um, the leaders of those institutions also acted as um, endorsers or uh, provided endorsement for um, what we were doing and helped uh, connect us with families. I think uh, something that ha hasn't necessarily come up that I think might be important is like if you, I think an important part of attracting a diverse set of families and a diverse community for enrollment is having a diverse staff. And I think that when people come 
and um, look at the school or consider that something that they'll be looking for to see if they feel like um, um, they're well represented in the staffing of the, the organization and just um, curricularly that they're, you know, we were very um, intentional about um, when we developed our, our, when we were developing a draft of our calendar of like holidays, that it was a very inclusive list of holidays. And that when we talked about the curriculum, we emphasized the fact that, you know, there would be um, lots of voices, uh, you know, that, that, you know, the curriculum would be approached um, through the voices of many. So that is just, I guess, another thing that I would say that we were very, very intentional about in our marketing. And also in our marketing, we, we boldly stated, um, we, we uh, took on this term of being diverse by design and um, established that as a stake in the ground as uh, an essential part of who we are um, in all of our marketing materials. So those are just a couple of things that I would add, but I think a lot of that stuff that was already stated was really great information and, and, and similar to things that we had done. Great, thank you so much, Francis. Um, we're about out of time. Um, I'm gonna just rapid fire <laughs> run through some resources um, and we'll share all of this. I think I saw a question about um, where the recording will be shared. We'll email it directly to anyone that registered for this forum. And it's also gonna be posted on the Natural Start website. So you'll be able to see it there and we'll share all these resources there as well. Um, Cause there's just so much to dig into, but I'll be, be, um, I'll be really quick here with this. Um, I tried to put together some resources that applied to um, some of the questions that we were getting. Uh, I'm sorry, my computer is, a little overwhelmed. <laughs> um, so the first two things that I want to point out are some uh, forum recordings that we have. Someone specifically asked about gear. Earlier this year, we did um, a forum all about the removing the barriers to accessing outdoor gear from um, like a, a program perspective. Um, that was a really great forum. Um, we also did a forum around this resource. Um, the Outdoor Preschool Policy Action Framework. That's a really great resource to dive into as well. Um, we have a few feature stories that I think are really applicable um, to what we're talking about. Um, one that I really wanna call out, um, Rachel Franz wrote, and she's, I think I saw her on this call, um, about fit um, and thinking about what that means because Sarah talked a lot about that too. Um, so I think that's a great read along with these other resources. Um, there's so, so, so much text on this slide, um, but it, we have member spotlights that we do every month and there's some really amazing programs that we highlight, so many amazing programs that we don't get a chance to highlight, but um, I would check out any of these, but I just wanna read just a, a piece from Brooklyn Park Nature Preschool, which is in Minnesota, because I think we've talked about so much here and, and I think all of us have ideas running through our head, um, but uh, something they said is it's, it's important to be realistic about the time it takes to do this work. The inclusion does not happen overnight. Um, so plan additional time for staff training and process improvement. It shouldn't feel rushed. Um, it's ongoing and needs to be considered in every part of operation from marketing and communication to tuition, registration process, and day-to-day -day interactions with families. So it's not just one thing. We're talking about considering it across the board and everything. And it's also not something that you're going to wake up tomorrow and have all figured out. Um, and, and last, I just want to share a couple resources from Natural Start and NAAA. Um, we have the Nature-Based Preschool Professional Practice Guidebook and there um, are Parts in that around equity um, and inclusion. So that's a great resource. You can download the introduction for free and then you can you can purchase the full guidebook. And then NAAWE has a whole section on their website that is continually being updated around resources um, related to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, so that's a great place to look as well. And like I said, we'll link all these resources, but I just wanted to kind of put them in your brain um, while we wrap up here.
and that's that's that. So thank you. Thank you so much to Sarah. Um, thank you, Keelan and Francis for jumping in as well. And thank you to everyone who contributed and to ask who asked questions. Um, this will be an ongoing conversation. Um, and uh, we appreciate you taking the time out of your day today to, to be here with us. So thanks. And Christy, you are the host, so you have end, end privileges. <laughs> All right, I'm doing it. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you so much.